It sounds strange to say that being a postman working in a sorting office could be a dangerous job. But if we go back, let's say, 60 to 70 years, then being a postman in a sorting office was incredibly dangerous indeed, especially if you worked on a travelling post office. The railways have always had a close association with Royal Mail. Going back to 1838, when the Act in Parliament ordered the railways to take the mail at a standardised fee. The separate railway companies at the time were under orders that the Royal Mail could specify the size of the train required for their specific needs. While this may seem unfair to the railway companies, causing them to take unnecessary loads, the railway companies themselves could dictate the standardised price to Royal Mail. And with no other way of taking them other than horse and cart, Royal Mail had little choice but to accept the terms. Following this act, the railway companies heavily invested in services to help with the post. One of their innovations included a carriage called a travelling post office. And if you go into the museum, you will see one of these such carriages on display. This carriage is very different from all the other goods carriages you tend to see. For starters, the door is very unusual and you can see nets and hooks on the sides. When you walk into the carriage, you can see the pigeonholes where the letters were needing to be sorted. But before I explain how all this works, let's go back in time to see how this all started. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830 was the first to take advantage of the lucrative deals that Royal Mail could bring. They transported the first letters between the two cities on the 11th of November, and it was so successful that they were given the contract to transport to London, and managed to deliver letters from Manchester to London in an impressive 16 hours. As the railways grew, so did the postal business and soon it became necessary to attach sorting coaches to more trains. These trains became more and more specialised and had to run express times. At first, passengers were allowed to travel with the mail trains, but only in first class. However, dedicated post trains soon began to emerge, and these became known as the travelling post offices. So let's have a look at the sorting coach. It's 60 foot long, 8 foot by 6 inches wide and open from end to end. Doors at the end of the carriages led to gangways where it provided a one-way passage up and down the train. A large counter sits on one side of the train and above that is hundreds of pigeonholes. The mail came into the train in sacks and these were emptied onto the counter. The counter also had a well which prevented rolled up items such as newspaper and magazines from rolling onto the floor. And on the other side of the carriage, pegs were mounted on the walls, which provided storage for the empty sacks and the sacks which needed to be sorted. To sort the post, you had to have a very good memory. Save for one or two, the pigeonholes were not marked, so you had to quite literally only a second to read the address that was on the letter, and you had to remember that every pigeonhole had a number. That number represented a district. To sort letters, you had to sort the letters into the correct pigeonholes. Not only were you expected to sort 60 to 70 letters per minute, but you also had to do the standing up and combat the swerves and movements of the train. Once the letters were sorted, they were put into leather sacks and well labelled. This is where the steel arm and the netting come in. These are called transductors. Now when not in use, these are neatly stored along the side of the coach and it's probably the most dangerous piece of apparatus. The first warning that a mail exchange is about to take place is the ringing of a bell. Door is rolled back and the net has to be opened ready to receive the incoming mail and one man takes a sorted bag and attaches it to the arm. The exchange happens in a split second and it's extremely loud. On the track side, another static traductor catches the sorted mail in its lower net, while the train collects the unsorted mail in its upper net and forces it into the carriage. 
This might sound a simple exchange, but when you consider that the train is moving at considerable speeds, and the leather bags can weigh upwards of £20 each, it can easily lock an unsuspecting postmaster off guard and off his feet. The traductor arm, once relieved of its load, also flies back and has been known to cause severe injury to anyone who is near the door. Despite this, however, the travelling post office was very popular and a very lucrative source of income for the railways and its working occupants. This type of rail exchange was used right up until 1971, when it was considered too dangerous as trains got faster. But travelling post offices still continued. However, due to the decline in letters following an increase in internet and emails, and the flexibility of the roads and the costs, travelling post offices and the service was eventually discontinued in 2004. The post is still continued to be taken by rail, but these tend to be in sealed carriages with no, po with no staff post on board. Not many people know that Royal Mail actually own a train line themselves, and the chances are you've never seen it. The line was created in 1913 and runs underground from Paddington to Whitechapel. This is the narrow gauge London Post Office Railway. It has six and a half miles of track, eight stations and a major sorting office deep beneath the bowels of London and ran from 1927 to 2003. The train themselves were driverless and electric and could shift an impressive 30,000 items per day. They ran every five minutes, delivering and collecting the mails from various sorting offices for 22 hours a day, with the other two hours being used for essential maintenance. The main central line sits over 70 feet deep and has a depot for the storage and the upkeep of the trains. At one point over 220 people worked on this line unseen up until its closure in 2003. By then, only three of the eight stations were operable. Royal Mail is obligated to keep these tunnels safe and dry and make sure there are no collapses or issues. In order to do this, the number of employees working on the railway was reduced down to just four engineers. In 2016, the Royal Mail decided that they would turn a site across the road from Mount Pleasant into a Royal Mail Museum. Luckily, the station had Mount Pleasant was in relatively good condition considering it hadn't been used since 1980 and even still had a train sat at its station that has been fitted with small seats for a Christmas party for that year. Royal Mail still maintains the majority of the line and much of the line is still untouched from when it closed in 2003. However, it has leased part of the line to the museum so that people can travel from Mount Pleasant Station on a 15 to 20 minute round trip in one of the postal trains. You can also pay to take a guided walking tour with access to the tunnels, tracks and platforms. Following the railway's closure, the National Railway Museum was very lucky to obtain one of these trains and cars which has been lovingly restored and put on display in the Great Hall. If you want to know more about the Royal Postal Museum, then I'll put a link in the description. But before I end this week's episode, let me leave you with a very special poem, written by local lad W.H. Auden. This is the night mail crossing the border, bringing the cheque and the postal order. Letters for the rich, letters for the poor. The shop at the corner, the girl next door. Pulling up Beetock, a steady climb, the gradients against her, but she's on time. Past cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder. Snorting noisily as she passes, silent miles of wind-bent grasses. Birds turn their head as she approaches, stare from brushes at her blank-faced coaches. Sheep dogs cannot turn her course, they slumber on with paws across. In the farm she passes, no one wakes, but in a jug, in a bedroom, gently shakes. Dawn freshens, her climb is done. Down towards Glasgow she descends, towards the steam tugs yelping down a glade of cranes, towards the fields of apparatus, the furnaces set on the dark plain like gigantic chessmen, 
all Scotland waits for her. In the dark glens, beside pale green locks, men long for news. Letters of thanks, letters from banks, letters of joy from girl and boy, receipted bills and invitations to inspect new stock or visit relations, applications for situations, amid lovers' declarations, and gossip, gossip from all the nations. News circumstantial, news financial, news with holiday snaps to enlarge in, news with faces, faces scrawled in the margin. Letters from uncles, cousins and aunts, letters from Scotland, from the south of France. Letters of condolence to the highlands and lowlands, written on paper of every hue. The pink, the violet, the white, the blue. The chatty, the catty, the boring, the adoring. The cold, the official, the hearts out, the hearts outpouring. Clever, stupid, short and long, all typed and printed and all spelt wrong. Thousands are still asleep, dreaming of terrifying monsters, or of friendly tea in the band behind Cranston's or Crawford's. Asleep in the work in Glasgow, sleep in Welser, Edinburgh, asleep in Granite, Aberdeen, they continue their dreams. But soon shall wake and hope for letters, and none will hear the postman's knock. At the quickening of the heart, for who can bear to feel himself forgotten?